interview. Good morning. <laughs> yeah, we need to practice that. Awesome. It's like a, you know, a duet here. We're going to start singing. Uh, get hey, I can't sing, but you can. Please. Uh, oh, nobody wants that, trust you. me. But uh, uh, <laughs> no, You do not, trust me. Uh, I am super impressed, though, that it's 80 degrees in the hub, and we got like 500 people at 830 talking about AI. So you know this is the thing to talk about. The hot button. <laughs> the hot button. Yeah, I think... Uh, I want you to remember this day, actually. A lot of you might look back on this day and think this was an inflection point in my life and a turning point. And the way to remember it is, you know, Pi Day is a very, very big deal here around MIT. That's the day everyone gets their acceptance letter. This is 413, not 314. So 413 is Pi backwards. It's a good way to remember it. So remember, backward Pi Day 2023 was the day that things changed. I also think I'm, this- I'm not smart enough to be in this room, by the way, just, just <laughs> clarifying. Well, the collective intelligence in this room is just mind blowing and we can achieve a lot today. Um, I think that uh, when we look back on this day, one of the things you may notice is that today we have, I think, 60 speakers or so that are the top people in this region in AI. It's a great opportunity to absorb information. This may be the last time in your life that you come to an event like this and there's no AI talking to you. It'll be all humans today. And I, I've been to a couple of events where AI take o takes over the speaking and they're really pretty incredible. So it's clearly where the, the puck is gonna go. Um, <laughs> Great. <laughs> but, but, you know, right now, that's what impresses people. But I think in hindsight, you'll look back and really savor this moment. This is humans talking to humans about what's about to happen. Well, although, Dave, how long have you been playing in this space? Long so, time, right? So, yeah, I'm, I'm like... Because you kind of are talking AI in some ways. I mean, you've been kind of <laughs> iterating for about, what, 30 years? Or 30, so, right? 30 plus years. Yeah, actually, Stephen Wolfram will be talking to us later today, and he predates me. I think he's probably the only guy around that predates me. But uh, I started working on neural networks uh, the exact time the back propagation paper came out in 1986. And so I started thinking about AGI and the singularity when I was 13. So my whole mission coming... Me down, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, my, my life journey started actually here at MIT with the supercomputers at the AI lab before it was CSAIL, uh, building large at the time, large a million parameter neural nets. And uh, we actually commercialized OCR, so handwriting recognition, built a company doing that, uh, then pivoted over to ad targeting, you hear a lot about ad targeting, uh, and then sold the company for a billion dollars uh, in today's dollars in 2000, and then started, you know, reinvesting, basically I'm a venture capitalist today, so reinvesting in the sector since then. We, uh, the timing of this event is so good, and I don't know whether you and John are, are good or lucky or both, probably both. And uh, it, we're, our current cover right now, the current Forbes cover is Alexander Wang from Scale AI, and the issue before that we had a big feature on Sam Altman, who we'll see later today, which is super cool. He was gonna be on the cover, but he wouldn't let us take his picture, and we only do, you know, for his fresh proprietary pictures. But anyway, this, the topic is so, so, so hot. We just released our, our AI 50, the Forbes AI 50. Did anybody see that on Tuesday? Looked at it. And, um, and what I thought was interesting was uh, we've been doing it for five years. So we thought we were early. We weren't, we weren't 35 years early, but we've been doing it for five years. And this was the first year that you really felt a, a pop on it. And we counted up how much money was raised by those 50 companies. It was about $27 billion raised just on those 50 companies. So it's an average of a half a billion per company raised. So it's pretty, if you have the idea, obviously the money's there. And it, that's, I think, more than double what it was even last year. Yeah. So what, what are you seeing, you know, in terms of what's investable? Is it anything AI gets money or where, where is the action right now? Yeah, there's a lot of spray and pray for sure, but that's because it's justified. I think that uh, Sam Altman will tell you later today, and he, he said it on the internet, there are really only about 10,000 people worldwide really working on this. Uh, and if you think about the impact on humanity that's imminent, it's a microscopic fraction. So I think, you know, from a venture capital point of view, if you poured money into everybody who's, who's brilliant and significant and working on this, you know, you'd, you'd come out ahead. So, if it, you know, I lived through the, the internet invention era, so kind of 1995 to 2000. And I think about those years a lot. I, I had a lot of success and luck during those years, but I needed to move even faster. And uh, you'll hear Eric Schmidt say this too over and over again when he was running Google. You know, they moved a mile a minute, yet in hindsight, we needed to move even faster. And so I think there's plenty of gas to pour on the fire, and there's a very, very acute shortage of, of brilliant people working. I, I think what's, what's different, though, is that they needed to, you know, they need to move faster, but right, AI itself is moving so fast. So, so, so it's not just the, the, you know, at, you know the, it's not about 
it being adapted, it's that the AI itself is so much faster in terms of how it iterates. How, how do we get our heads, and how do I get my head around that a lot what, of you what guys? Was, so I, I'll tell you a couple of holy crap moments I've had in the last couple of years, but what, what was your holy crap moment in this, in this area? I was with my daughter on uh, just two days ago, and uh, she was studying for her AP history test. And I was a history major in college, an American history major. So she said, can you help me bunch the presidents by theme? I thought, that's a really interesting idea. So I said, well, why, why don't we try it in, chat, you know, in, in GPT-4? And it was really good. I mean, better, better than I could do. And uh, you know, that's however many decades of studying this stuff. And it was just instantaneous, but it was, it wasn't, you know, we all have seen what it could do, but it, it legitimately was smart. It was like really nuanced. And yeah. that was, that was, that was because an area I know, I was like, whoa. Yeah. You know what blew my mind? So we had um, our summer interns in 2019 working on GPT-2. And that included three of my four kids who are, you know, high school and college age working on GPT-2. And uh, GPT-2 was 1.5 billion parameters, and you know, the current models are about a trillion parameters. And that was just, what, four years ago. Uh, and their takeaway from GPT-2 is, yeah, this kind of sucks. And so I thought that was a great life lesson for them because now everybody's mind is blown by what ChatGPT and GPT-4 can do with about a trillion parameters. And so for them to see how short that timeline is from, yeah, this kind of sucks, to, oh my God, this could do my homework for me, that gives them a sense of where it'll be in two and three years. Now, nobody knows exactly, but the rate of acceleration is unbelievable. And we're tracking it through the parameter count. And, you know, that's kind of a geeky metric, but it's a really important metric. But really, you know, it, but it's not linear, you know, it, it, it's going to be exponential, right? Yeah. So, so how, do you, how do we even get our head around that? I mean... Yeah, no, because I've, I've seen these, these real-world problems get knocked off one at a time. And there's always a, a bunch of people saying, you know, chess is never going to happen, Go is never going to happen. But a lot of these are kind of academic problems. Talking to a person intelligently, I mean, that, that's the, the game changer. And that's what's opened the doors to all the executive boardrooms. Like right now, an AI expert who really understands large language models or neural nets can talk to virtually any CEO of any Fortune 500. Never in my life have I seen a tech revolution you know, the internet in being invented was the closest thing, because that was a big game changer too. But this is so much faster and so much bigger. And so access to the top leaders in the world, and government leaders too, is like nothing I've ever seen before. So it's, that's, it's just mind-blowing. What's the startup, you know, and you, you get to see a lot of them, what's the startup you've seen, either by name or just by what they're doing, that's blown you away the most? Uh, you know, I, I think the thing that for me is most mind-boggling is watching the AI generate code. And uh, that's not the thing that opens everyone else's mind. They love to have it write poetry or have it write their homework. Um, but when you see it write code, everybody who's understood the evolution of AGI knows that that flashpoint, that tipping point, is when the system improves itself. And when you see the code it's writing today, it's really pretty damn good. But a lot of people who are real core engineers say, no, it's, it's not as good as me. And that's right, that's true. Uh, but I saw how GPT-2 wrote really kind of mediocre to garbage text and now, now seeing what it's writing just four years later. So from my point of view, we're within, say, about a two-year window where the code is a force multiplier of at least 10 to 100 on a software engineer. And so for me, that's, that's the day when the rate of improvement in the core algorithms is gonna go exponential. So that's very, very close. So then in theory for basically every job market, we're looking at the ability to prompt. If you can prompt code, yeah. it becomes more valuable than being a superstar coder. If you could prompt text, it becomes more valuable than being a writer or editor. Well, and, and, in and theory, the, right? Exactly. Where do you see that playing out? Well, that, that, there's a really important corollary to what you just said, which is, if you think about what was happening over the last 10 years, there's an acute shortage of technologists uh, all over the world. And so people were starting to move their work over to India and China and elsewhere, you know, just, just to get the raw human power. Now with AI Assist, it actually feels like it's gonna start consolidating again. And if you think about the block we're on right now and the fraction of all AI thinking that goes on in the world, how much of it is within about a quarter of a mile of you right now, it's, it's a massive, massive fraction. It feels like now with AI Assist, a lot of that's gonna consolidate again. And so that'll, that'll be just a big you know, turning point in the history of the world. So nobody knows exactly where that'll take us, but it's gonna mean the amount of power accumulated you know, in this group and the amount of ability to do good for the world is gonna be hundreds of times higher than it ever was before. 
or bad for the world. That you know, we're going to talk about that. I'm sure throughout the day. But what, where where are you on this uh, amazing versus existential threat? I mean, obviously, it's a little of both, but yeah. where do you tip? Which side? Well, I've, you know, I've been studying this pretty much my whole life, and so I'm on the extreme end of optimism. I think that the vast majority of bad that's done in the world is people doing bad things to other people. Um, and, I, you know, I, I, I worry a little bit that the government is miles behind the rate of change, and, you know, government's kind of... Surprise! Yeah, yeah. So... Uh, but, you know, now we have you know, Eric Schmidt and a bunch of brilliant, uh, well-meaning people actually spending most of their time in Washington trying to get ahead of it. So, so there's cause for optimism there. But, but I, what I think I'm really optimistic about is most of the dystopians think that this thing's going to somehow become conscious and, you know, go Terminator on us. They don't, these things don't do that. You know, they're, they're actually, um, they're incredibly powerful in ways that humans aren't powerful. And they're not trying to become human. They're doing whatever you direct it to do. Uh, and so right now, one of my mind-blowing moments was uh, there was a, an AI at the last XPRIZE Abundance 360 conference. So I'm on the board of XPRIZE. And, and uh, you know, the co-host is an avatar. And, and Peter Diamandis, the founder, is talking to the avatar. And it's talking back. And it's just pretty mind-blowing. Uh, but I don't know how much of that is scripted. But in the demo hall, there was a robot. And the people running the robot said, talk to it. I was like, yeah, I don't really want to talk to your robot. And they said, no, you, you, you should. You should try to talk to the robot. And so I say, hey, robot. And the robot has this beautiful, sweet, engaging, perfect voice. Because of course it does. You know, it's voice synthesis. It can be anything it wants to be. And, and if you're in a crowded, loud room, it can just talk over everybody because it has a volume control. <laughs> and, it, and so it grabs my attention like, and it just says, ask me anything. So I ask it something obscure about nuclear physics or something and it has an answer. It has, and I don't know if it's right or not because you know, how would I know, but, but, it, but it sounds right and I'm sure it probably was because it's read everything on the internet. What, what blew my mind is I didn't really realize voice recognition has been here for about 10 years and voice synthesis has been really good for maybe five years. And the missing ingredient in the middle was the large language model, the thing that glues it together and makes it say something worth, worth listening to. But how quickly those three things would be glued together into this virtual thing. And, and so then I said, well, can you start talking to me in Spanish? And of course, it switches to Spanish instantaneously. And then what really blew my mind is said, I said, now talk to me in Mandarin Chinese. Let's have this. I'll speak in English. You talk to me back in, in Mandarin Chinese. And the guy running it said, it doesn't do Chinese. Wait a minute. And he does something on his keyboard. <laughs> and then the thing is talking Chinese. And I think, wow. So it's what it does differently from humans that is going to be amazing uh, in the next few years. Because really, if you think about what makes human suffering uh, happen, all of it is solvable. It's, it's obvious. It's food. It's logistics and distribution. It's shelter. It's these things that make basic human happiness are really pretty obvious. And we've struggled with the automation and the abundance of those things for the last, you know, really since the Industrial Revolution. We're on the cusp of being able to solve all of them in one iteration. All right, so let's, you know, we all know. And Dave, you have seven more minutes to be really provocative. <laughs> okay. we'll ramp it up then. <laughs> Six, 650. Uh, the, um, we know the, like you said, the dystopian version. We've 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 all seen that, and it's the end of the world, and it's right, and it's not the AI doing it; it's a human prompting an AI to do that. That's the we're, that's the doomsday scenario. So, you as an optimist, as a 35-year practitioner, what is the? Let, let's be optimistic. What is the one thing that you? Well, this could happen because of what's happening right now. It blows people blows people's well, minds. I, I, the, the next big thing, um, right now, it's very easy for all of you guys to use AI in kind of the virtual world. So things that are digital, creating something digital, and very few people are working on the robotics version of it. But if you think about what the world needs in terms of shelter and food for everyone, you need to tie the AI back to physical things done for us in the real world, and that's robotics. Robot, the robotics industry is lagging like crazy. So the next thing I think that's gonna happen you know, the robots are incredibly visual and compelling, and that's why in all the movies, you know, the, the AI movies that focus on the virtual world don't get a lot of audience, and the AI where, we're, you know, cars roll over and terminators, like, those are the ones that get all the attention. Well, the, the robotic stuff that you can demo, like right now, you can see these drones here at LIDS, at, you know, the, uh, right across the street over here. Uh, the, the drones pick up a net, and then they grab a ball, and they start throwing it back and forth to each other, and then they pick up a beer, 
and they bring you the beer, but then they do a, a flip, you know, holding the beer and they drop it. Those things really get people's imagination going on, on what we could create. So I think what you'll see uh, in about a two year time frame is a lot more very, very intelligent robots that are washing your windows for you. And then, you know, the Roomba will become a joke. You know, you'll have these general purpose capabilities and that'll open up people's imagination about why this is good for the world. Uh, as opposed to dystopia. I love the idea that R Roomba is the TRS-80 of like, yeah. <laughs> of yeah. robots. Yeah, you yeah. might want to buy one just as a collector. It's right? true, yeah, that's very, fun. that's very funny. I, um, we did a, uh, we did, when Forbes did, we had our 100th anniversary six years ago, and so we did a special issue on the 100 greatest living business minds. And I had this great idea, I'm like, let's ask each one of them the technology that they think is going to change the next hundred years, and then we'll print them all. And two people said blockchain, and about ninety-eight said AI, and we didn't prompt them, and so we threw that out. It, it this has this has been coming, uh, but it, it just it feels like this. Is it that the public is finally aware of it, and maybe because of you know ChatGPT? that all of a sudden it's in the public? Or is, are we in a breakthrough moment right now or are we in a PR breakthrough right no, now? No, we're definitely in a breakthrough moment right now. I think the, the PR will ramp up, if that's even possible, but the PR will ramp up. But I, what happened is the parameter count in the neural nets got bigger and it's been getting bigger very methodically. And the reason it's been below the radar is because adding more parameters to a neural net doesn't necessarily do anything for the world below some threshold, but then it pops above that threshold. So, you know, when we did handwriting recognition, that was really cool, but then it hit a dead spot. And then you do image classification, and that's really cool, and then it hits a dead spot. But where we are now with the large language, language models, there's no dead spot coming. This is just accelerating into all areas of human endeavor from where it is right now. But, but just, to, just to visualize, what does this mean? You know, the human brain has about 100 trillion connections or, or parameters in it. Um, and the large language models now have a trillion. Uh, when GPT-2 came out, it was a little over a billion, and then GPT-3 had about 175 billion, so now we're at a trillion. Um, if you listen to Jensen Huang, uh, the forecast for the NVIDIA chips is about a million percent increase in speed over the next decade, so 10,000 X. So that means we go from a trillion, and then in the next couple years, it'll go to 100 trillion. So that matches- It's like a Moore's law of it's exactly what it is, yeah, yeah. And so, so what's amazing about these particular algorithms versus anything else I've ever seen is if you take a spreadsheet or you take you know, any normal code and you make it run a thousand times faster, it's just faster. It doesn't really do anything different, it's just faster. These are different, these are self-organizing. So as you throw more horsepower at it, it does things that you didn't even expect. And you know, the other thing is that the large language models, you know, they are clearly getting intelligent. But their target variable, what they're training... Your, your delivery's here, Dave, so can you... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Uh, so, so what they're trained on is read the entire internet and then I'll show you some text and you p predict what the next word is. That's the only objective function, just predict what the next word is. But to do that problem well, you have to become intelligent. And so the thing naturally becomes intelligent to solve that problem. That's the kind of the nature of emergent intelligence. You don't have to program it to be intelligent, you just have to give it a task that requires intelligence and then it emerges. And so that's, that's why it's fine. It, it's some of the, it's some of the, yeah, it's well, some of the AI, AI jokes I've seen where somebody says, tell a joke about this and it, again, I don't know whether it's just finding a joke that already exists or it's coming up with one, but that's the one where you go, whoa, that's, you know, for me at least, that, that was a that was a heavy moment. What 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 are we looking at for the job market? Not just for you know the people in this room who are you know to the extent that they're paying attention in really good shape. Uh, I, it, this is going to create some crazy disruption, right? Big time, big time. Uh, where do you see it hitting first? Well, I think uh, today is all about creating businesses that ride this wave and the, this kind of incredible next five years we're going into. Um, Nobody in this room needs to worry about the job market personally, but you should be worried about it globally. I mean, it's really clear that mankind, humankind will benefit tremendously, um, but in transition there, a lot of jobs, uh, you know, anything mechanical, uh, a lot of actuarial type jobs, tons of customer service jobs. You know, the, the number one job in the entire world, if you do it by category, is driver. And you know the self-driving thing has been in the on the radar for quite a while now. That eliminates the biggest category of job in the entire world. 
Uh, so yeah, a huge amount of disruption that's coming from that. But but the overall benefit, way, way, way out. Way, way.